these bones will sing. Sing it. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. without you. Lord, you are all we need. You're all we've ever needed. Lord, we didn't sing this song, but the battle does belong to you always, Lord. I pray that we can just sit down on our knees, Lord, and just, just pray to you. That's all we got. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In precious name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Grace College. It's good to see you all today. Thank you for being here. I am excited to be able to introduce our speaker this morning. Our speaker is Dr. Walter R. Strickland II. I've never called him that in my life. I've known him for over 20 years, but it sounds good. Very, very smart. Um, he's an educator who desires to equip people to live with biblical wisdom understand the African-American theological tradition, and conduct education in business with cultural intelligence. He serves as assistant professor of systematic and contextual theology at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, teaching pastor at Amajo Day Church and founder of AppTree Learning, an ed tech company. Dr. Strickland was born in Chicago and raised in California and has written or contributed to over 10 books and holds a PhD in theology from the University of Aberdeen. But way more importantly to me is his longtime friendship. Steph and I have known Dr. Strickland for over 20 years. In fact, he was my college RA. And before he came, I made him sign a contract that said absolutely no stories from college. Uh, he was the guy who like studied on the hall, I was not the guy who studied on the hall. Um, so uh, thankful so much to have my friend Walter here today. He has been such an encouragement and provided so much wisdom to me. Uh, later this afternoon, Dr. Strickland is offering a time of spiritual encouragement for our whole campus. You can come hear him speak on the gifts of the African-American Christian tradition. He'll speak at 345 in MC100, so come out this afternoon for that time, and there will be food, um, so that's another reason to come out as well. So please give a hearty welcome to my good friend, Dr. Walter Strickland. Well, good morning. Okay, we'll work on that. Uh, I've only been in town for a couple of hours, 
And several times I've been asked to give a story about my good friend, Dr. Flam. And so I was cycling through all the stories, and I only came up with one that I can tell. Uh, I'm just joking, but kind of serious at the same time. So he was going to run for Student Government Association president uh, going in, into his senior year. And then uh, we were all wondering who his running mate was going to be because presidents and vice presidents, they would sort of run together. And so uh, he picked a, a, a blonde in my class named Steph Heaney. And we were just like, well played, Drew. <laughs> and he denied any sort of romantic interest, uh, hands down. And then we, we saw them sort of walking closer on the sidewalks, and he still denied any romantic interest when he pursued her to be uh, his vice president. And I, do you still deny that today? Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's good that you've repented and stopped lying, you know, <laughs> because it, it's true from the beginning. I was like, Drew, well done. And it's, it's still working for you. So anyway, so that's my one Drew story that I'll, I'll leave you with today. But it, it is truly a blessing to be here. I do bring greetings from Imago Day Church and also Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so if you have a Bible, turn to Ruth chapter 2. We'll be in verses 5 to 12 together in our time. And as you turn there, uh, there's a variety of reasons to study the book of Ruth in Scripture. Some of you guys who are more the seminary type might be interested in the biblical theological angle of getting a picture and what it was like during the time of the judges. Others who are interested in the more vocational angle are looking at Ruth's, Ruth's work ethic. And then uh, others, there's a question of survival here. I was on the plane last night and this person was watching like the survivor kind of show. Um, and then, but this is really what Ruth was. She was a survivor, as Beyonce and them would say. Uh, surviving against all odds. Some of you guys might be interested in the romantic part of the conversation, like an old school Christian mingle. You go by the grain pile, lay by somebody's feeding, you know, and all that good stuff. But we won't be in that chapter today, but you know, it's there. But today we'll be looking at a little bit of all of those. And so if you're, if you're there we're with, in Ruth chapter uh, 2, I want to give us a little bit of background in Ruth chapter 1 to make our uh, text in 2 verses 5 to 12 make sense. And so in the beginning of chapter 1 and verse 1, you said that there was a, a famine in the land. This was a disaster in an agrarian society. For us, if there's a famine, it's okay because we just get our stuff trucked into the grocery store or flown in or butted in from somewhere else. But in this time, if there was a famine in the land, it was a problem. And then you see in verses 3 and 5, you see the death of the men. In verse uh, 3, Elimelech, Ruth's father-in-law, died. And then in verse 5, Malchon and Kilion, uh, Ruth's husband and brother-in-law, died as well. So this was certainly a very sad thing for, for Ruth and Naomi and uh, Ruth's sister-in-law. But at that time, in addition to the sadness, in a patriarchal society, the men can do a number of things that women could not do, like own land and have wealth passed down and so on which is a big deal in a farming town. And so really what we're saying is that the death of the men is certainly something that they would grieve, but there's also a lot of social implications for their well-being as well. And then in verses 16 to 17, we see Ruth, she adopts her mother-in-law. And so I'll just be honest, Ruth is a better person than I am. Because if I had my back against the wall, there's a famine in the land, my husband just died, and all the, the details that are stacking up, I would find somebody scrappy. Someone who was not melancholy. I would find somebody who would be my partner in crime so we can like do our thing. But Ruth, <laughs> she's fantastic. So she took her mother-in-law in, even though she was down in the dumps. This was such a gracious thing for Ruth to do. And so then uh, also in verse 19 of chapter 1, as we're getting closer to our text today, we see now Ruth, the Moabitess, she moved to Bethlehem. And so this is salt in the wound of all this, because now she's not only uh, destitute in all these ways, but now she is an immigrant, a foreigner. Uh, for those of you who read Deuteronomy in Hebrews, she's the gar that it talks about in Deuteronomy uh, throughout the scripture. And so it's safe to say that her safety net that she had crumbled underneath her feet. And now as we transition to the first four verses of chapter 2, we see that um, Naomi remembered when they got back to uh, Bethlehem, that there was a family member, Boaz, someone who was a, a, a noble man. She said uh, a, a, he's, a, he's a man who is, is, is good and godly is essentially what she gets at. 
And so then Ruth goes to his field. And then now this is where we are in uh, Ruth chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. We'll read about Ruth's faithfulness with little. And here's the, the first couple of verses, starting in verse 5. It says, Boaz asked his servant, who, who was, who was uh, in charge of the harvesters, whose young woman is this? And the servant answered, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the, the territory of Moab. Verse 7, she asked, will you let me gather the fallen grain amongst the bundles behind the harvesters? And she came and has been on her feet since early morning, except that she rested a little in the shelter. And so already in verse 7, we see that uh, Ruth is somebody who took initiative. During a difficult time, Ruth saw that she had one, basically, outlet for, to pursue, and she did. So she went to Boaz's field, and she got to work. And also we see, sort of hidden in uh, verse 7 as well, is that she knew the law. She knew the scriptures. So she took initiative, and she knew the scriptures. How do we know that? Well, it assumes that she knew the scriptures because she understood that if Boaz was a man of noble character, as Naomi explained him in verse 1, then he would be one who upholds the law. And if you read uh, verses like Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 22, it says something like this. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you're not to reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord, your God. And also Le Leviticus 19, verse 9 reads similarly. And so she knew, if, okay, if he is a man who is noble, who's godly, then he is probably doing these kinds of things, because, but she had to know the scriptures, the law in that time, for her to understand this. So in addition to uh, taking initiative and knowing the scriptures, she also worked hard in verse 7. Uh, I think Naomi is a great example of faithfulness and difficulty. And per the sermon's uh, sort of title today, this sort of faithfulness with little, it is the initiative that she took that is so good. And many of us would say yes and amen. Let's like get this example and pass it on to anybody who's struggling with poverty in the country because this is, the, this is sort of the, the, uh, the ace up the sleeve. And I would say yes, I wholeheartedly commit the example of Ruth to all of us. But there's also an important uh, aspect of this story that we begin to see in verses 8 and 9. And this is Boaz's faithfulness with much. Let's read verses 8 and 9 together. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in any other field. And don't leave this one, but stay here, close to my female servants. See which field they are harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have, have filled. And so there's no Ruth's success story that we're seeing without the faithfulness of Boaz. So Boaz was not a legalist. He didn't do the bare minimum or the bare requirements of the law to check a box to help this poor immigrant woman. You see, his love for the Lord God overflowed onto Ruth. And so we see in verses 8 and 9, Boaz, he did far more than he needed to. It says uh, in verse 8, he requested that Ruth remain in the field with his hired women. And so if you guys remember in, Le in, um, in Leviticus 19 and also Leviticus 23, it says, you know, to leave the edges of your field. So that's not what he did for Ruth. He says, hey, come with the women that I have hired. Have some of my first fruits. Not just the stuff on the edges. Have more than what the law says you are, I'm required to give you. Also in verse 9, he offered her protection from his male servants. Boaz would say, hey, I'm the boss. Don't mess with her. If you mess with her, you mess with me. He was protecting her. A good and godly thing. He also, uh, in verse 9, offered her water. We also take water for granted these days, too. Y'all got a canal and a, and a lake over here? Uh, many times they had to go and get water from faraway places so that the people who were working could eat. So Boaz was basically paying people to go get the water and to bring it back to where they were harvesting. So it wasn't like this was without cost for him. So he was like, hey, not only you know, go with my hired women, I'm going to protect you, but I'm also going to give you the very things that are making me successful. So it wasn't about the bottom line for Boaz. It was about helping a fellow image bearer. And then in verse 10, we see Ruth's gratefulness. 
this is what the verse says. It says, she fell face down, bowed to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor with you so that you noticed me, although I'm a foreigner? So Ruth, she didn't presume on Boaz's kindness or his faithfulness or his following the law. She knew that that, that, that he was a man who was going far and above and beyond the law. And so we live in an era of extreme entitlement. Talking about the haves and the have-nots. Everyone thinks that everything should just be given to them, but Ruth's heart of gratefulness is teachable to us. Anything that we receive, we ought to be grateful for. I think Ruth is also astonished by this because she knows the very heart uh, of, of man. And again, before I said that she is somebody who's read the scriptures and she knows stories like the Tower of Babel in Genesis, uh, was that chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. She understands the fact that they built a tower in this plain of Shinar to make a name not for God, but for themselves. They use the very resources and skill and ability that, that God has given them to provide for themselves and to love others, all to make a name for themselves. So she knows what is in the heart of humanity, but she sees that Boaz is one who is helping and loving, and she is just overflowing with gratefulness for him. So Genesis 11 is a wonderful window into the human heart where we're prone to find our worth and identity with the work of our hands and not in our Father who gave us the gifts and to, to work and support ourselves and bless others. And so we see Boaz, a person who's just uh, doing, you know, so many things for so many people. And I think the Bible is uh, fair to say that to whom much is given, much is required. Boaz did have much. He had numerous workers. We see that in verse 5, he had to go and see who was in charge of the harvesters because he had layers in his organization. You guys see that? He also had lots of land necessary to grow a number of crops. He also had access crops, enough to give away some, so much where he was able to just give to, Ru to, to Ruth and Naomi over and over again. He had ample money. In chapter 4, we see the buyback Elimelech's land, and he also had influence at the city gate because when he said, hey, I want to buy the land, everyone who had to be there, they showed up, which is a pretty great position to be in. I think so. Anyway, uh, so it could be said that Boaz is a man of great power or influence, but I think in 2023, we might even say he's a man of great privilege. And I think that claim is true, but in our contemporary cultural moment, we take words like that and use them as a bludgeon to beat people with means over the head, but I think Boaz helps us reimagine how, uh, how to understand influence and power in these things away from something that we should be ashamed of to something that should be stewarded. You guys see that? Boaz just didn't have all this stuff that God had given him, and he's sitting in the corner, woe is me, I have all this stuff, what should I do with it? He looked around and he saw the needs of others. He looked around and said, who can I bless with what I've received from God? So he didn't sit around and cower as our culture wants us to say, if we've been given these resources, we have to keep our head up. Loving God, being transformed by him, and looking out to see how we can bless others. And I think there's an application for, for all of us. You guys are here preparing for ministry of some sort or vocation of, of some sort. And there's a tendency for us to, to think that we're not uh, of the type of people that could be a Boaz in the world. I think it's very helpful for us to understand here. All of us are going to be given resources and opportunities to steward things. And you're like, hey, um... I'm not even sure how I'm going to pay for lunch. But at the same time, <laughs> don't worry, we'll help you. Hey, Drew, help him out if he can't pay for lunch. Uh, and it, but as you guys grow in your careers, you have more and more of an opportunity to bless others. So getting the habit of that now, and then you know, the Lord will then multiply that by his grace. And so for those of you who are thinking, well, I'm just going to go into being a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor or, uh, or whatever, th this, is, this is a wonderful place for us to park just for a second and say that is real ministry and an opportunity to advance the kingdom as well. 
We have to see the opportunities that God gives us in any vocational space as being able to help bring uh, kingdom benefit. And I, I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. It says, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Those are like the clerical caller type people, seminary type folks. You see that list? Apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And so that's real ministry. Those are doing, you're doing real things. And now the verse 12 type people, which are the blue and white collar type folks, it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So who, who's the one doing the building up of the body of Christ? The verse 12 people. And so there's a great sort of hand in glove. Hand in hand between those who are doing ministry in a sort of uh, exp explicitly ministry context, but there's also kingdom building done for those who are not explicitly going to be in ministry co type context. This is exactly what Boaz was doing. What a great example of this. And so we glorify God by making ourselves useful to others, loving our neighbors. And so I love Amy Sherman uh, in her book, Kingdom Calling. She talks about the ways in which we sort of identify or mirror uh, God in our labors. And so for some of you guys are saying, I'm not sure how exactly what I want to do would sort of mirror or sort of uh, per, per, uh, portray God to the world. Well, in our, God is a creative God. God fashioned the physical uh, in, in, in world. And so those who also fashion things are builders and designers and architects and sculptures. Well, our God is a, a providential God. God's provision uh, sustains us and creation. And so those who do work of conserving and sustaining and public utility and welders and plumbers and so forth, they're, they're mirroring God in that work. So God is a God of justice, and he's one who uh, maintains justice. So if you're a legal secretary or a lawyer or a city manager and so on and so forth, God is a God of compassion. And we can continue to go down the ways in which, in your work, you can be a conduit of grace to those who are around you, no matter what you end up doing with your life. And so when that's the case, the tendency is going to be to absorb all of the glory a lot, you know, uh, it, when someone thanks you for doing something, you know, especially if you're, you know, working hard on that thing, trying to be strategic about it, when someone thanks you for it, to absorb all that thanks and praise. But I think Boaz is also help, helpful to us in verses 11 and 12, because Boaz points Ruth to her true provider. Remember, verse 10, she was thanking him profusely for all that he had done. Now, verses 11 and 12, it says this, Boaz answered her, everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. How you have left your father and mother and your native land and how you've come uh, to a people that you didn't previously know, verse 12, may the Lord reward you for what you have done. And may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. You guys see that? She was like, verse 10, hey, you are so good to me, Boaz. You have done all these things that you see me, even though I'm a foreigner and all these things. But he's like, look, look, look. It's not me under whose wings you've come to take refuge. It's the Lord God of Israel. Praise be to him. He is your provider. It's not me. God is just using me as a conduit of grace. And so he points her to her true provider, and that is God. And so rather than absorbing it again, all the praise and all the glory for himself, he just says, look, don't look to me, look to him. And if you are a pastor or a disciple maker, or if you are a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor, as you're doing any of these things, you can be one that points people to the Lord. And so I think it, it's, it's neat to see how Boaz and his life, he did so many things that contribute to the big story of uh, Scripture. He met a practical need. He provided food for those who needed food, Ruth and Naomi. And he also played a part in God's big story. So God strategically used Boaz and his actions to sustain the line of the Messiah. And so we are actually the beneficiaries of Boaz's faithfulness. Wouldn't it be neat if all you're doing is just being faithful? You are, you're just doing, following the call of God. 
being somebody who is just a conduit of grace, loving God and neighbor, and then generations down the line, God begins to actually use those things, multiplies them for generations. Just this last night, I was sitting in the airport in Atlanta, and the place where I was was kind of full, and so I just kind of like, there's, there's like four chairs, and two dudes were sitting in two of them. So I just said, hey, guys, can I sit here? I plumped my bag down. And there was uh, one, of the, one of the guys there, it was two coworkers, he was sharing the gospel with this coworker. The guy was probably about 35, sharing the gospel with the guy who was about 55. The, the, the guy who was, you know, being the recipient of this good news, it was awesome to see how interested he was in the things of God. And so I began to pray, like, God, do something in this man's life because he's hearing the word of truth. He's hearing it. And then the young man began to talk to this older man about the legacy that he could leave that could last for generations. And I was like, praise be to God. Because look, so in the same way that Boaz was used and there was generations for implications for generations, God can use us even in our faithfulness by his grace to impact generations. And my new friend Maverick, I call my friend just because I have his business card now, uh, and I'm going to email him tonight. But I pray that his labors in the gospel with his coworker, talking about how in his work, as he's making a sales call, how the gospel makes a difference. Because his value is not on the line if that person is, is, buys their stuff, but he is free in Christ. And also, uh, in Boaz, we see a picture of Christ. There are multiple clues here. Uh, one is the setting in Bethlehem that this whole, this whole story is just being set up in, this, in the bread basket, uh, which is what Bethlehem is sort of alluding to. The concept of feeding is significant in the story, not only with the name of Bethlehem, but also in the fact that Boaz feeds Naomi. But also, this is the place where the bread of life would eventually be born. And so we see this, this picture of sort of Christ that, we're, that Boaz is pointing us to. And also, secondly, this idea of the kinsman redeemer carries with it the expectation of another who would not just redeem our land, but would, re- but would redeem our souls. And this is such a good thing. And then lastly, Boaz's faithfulness to God was evidence to Naomi that God is still with her in the storm. And so it's important now for us to, to see this. And so the, the very first place where the words of Naomi are recorded, it's in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Okay, it says, and she says this when she returns back, Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, she answered, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And so why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has opposed me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? And so as a result of all that's transpired with with Ruth being faithful with little and Boaz being faithful with much, we see that uh, she's seeing the very hand of God, the kindness of God in her life in the time where her husband and her sons had died. Do you know how devastating that is? To bury a husband and two children? Who's going to take care of you? What do you do? But then, but then Ruth, with what she had, she demonstrated God's love to her. And then Boaz, with what he had, demonstrated God's love to her. And then we see her in chapter 4 holding a, a, another example of the promise of God in her arms when she's holding Obed. And it says this, uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. It says, Ruth gave birth to a son, verse 14. The woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord, who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you is better, uh, is, is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became a mother to him. The, the neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed, who was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And we know that because we read the Bible and we see that in Genesis or in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, Jesus goes directly through David's line. We also see this with the Davidic covenant, if you're following me there in 2 Samuel. And so all this pointing to the fact that it is even so 
uh, so Boaz's faithfulness even contributed to the line of the Messiah. This is such good news. And so as we look at Ruth, as we look at Boaz, I'm going to have a little time with Cousin Walter here. So let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me break this down just for a second because I've got four minutes according to this thing. I, I'm aware that I'm standing in front of speaking to people in this room who want to do great things with their life. And praise God for that. Praise God that you guys want to do amazing things for the Lord Jesus. And I pray that God will give you a, a, a divine and good and godly uh, aspiration to do so. But one thing that I would say is that this is the most activistic generation that we've seen in decades, even centuries in our country. And, and one thing I would want to leave you with is this. As I've tried to sort of summarize what the Christian life is all about, three words continue to come to mind. Proclamation, demonstration, and transformation. All three are necessary to have a robust Christian life. Proclamation, demonstration, transformation. You trying to figure out why I put them in that order? I don't know, because that's how they came out. Because we got to do all three continuously. So don't think, don't read into my order. Just because they all just kind of happen, right? But one thing that I will warn you of, because you have to have all three, some of us lean so much into demonstration we leave transformation and proclamation to the side. Some of us want to lean into proclamation that you're not transformed and you're not loving anybody as you proclaim the Jesus of love. Some of you guys want to be a monk and just be transformed and read scripture and quote verses and stuff like that, which is a good thing, but in isolation, you're a clinging symbol. And so what, so what I would want for us to do today is that every, so different denominational traditions, different sort of, uh, sort of uh, different people, uh, Christians of different backgrounds, they may lean into one of the three a little bit more naturally, but what I'm going to say is that we have to link arms with Christians who excel in other ways and not just talk about them. These people over here, oh, they just so demonstration oriented, they don't even, they haven't even shared the gospel. Well, they're, man, these people, they're, they're so busy, you know, talking about Jesus that they don't even, like, say their prayers at night. They don't mean, like, all these things. Christians are so petty at some, sometimes. What I'm trying to say is that we need each other. Those who have different sort of uh, leanings or just different natural inclinations, we need each other. So one day, this, this should be your situation. The person who's about demonstrating the love of Christ uh, says, hey, let's go in, uh, and feed people at the soup kitchen. They call their transformation and proclamation friend. And the transformation friend's like, we got to pray beforehand. And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. And then meanwhile, the person who's proclamation oriented is at the soup kitchen telling everybody about the hope that's within them. And then, and then they're, they're sharpening each other in this way. And so what I want to say, if you want to be a Ruth who does good, loves God, and loves others, if you want to be a Boaz, loves God, loves others, you have to be somebody who is uh, transformed, someone who is demonstrating the realities of the kingdom, and then someone who's also proclaiming exactly what they are so they have an answer for the hope that is within you. And so that's my little just ending charge for this morning. I'm grateful for the example of Ruth and Boaz. I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that we can uh, do this kind of work ourselves in the vocational ministry context in which God has called us, in the uh, non-vocational ministry context but you, where you can still do good kingdom work. I think we see that example all throughout this text in this whole book, but also understanding that the robust Christian life is constitutive of each of these. And if we lean into one without the others, we are impoverishing our Christian life. And so as we uh, go away today, one thing I want us to do is to, to just love God deeply to where that becomes the catalyst for loving others. And then the fragrant aroma of Christ just fills the air and we could tell you people exactly who it is that heals their physical brokenness and heals them spiritually, and that is Jesus Christ. Our hope is built on nothing less, right? This is our hope this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time where we can be in the Word together. 
We thank you that scripture is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And for that, God, we're grateful that you haven't left us without, without a witness to who you are and what you're doing and how you would have us live. God, you are so kind to talk to us. You're so kind to, to give us so many pages just demonstrating what your character is and how we can be transformed into Christ's likeness. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here who are uh, aspiring to be a variety of things. I pray that as they aspire to do things, they would not get far from the fact that there's a God who they are a, a, are a conduit of grace from, who they're pointing people to, not for their glory, but for your glory. And so, God, I ask for your help for all of us with that. There's so many times where we can get sucked up into self-promotion, doing things for our name's sake, but God, I pray that we live for your name's sake. And so God, I pray that with every test that's taken today, for every quiz that's taken as well, for every lecture that's delivered and listened to, for every uh, student learning outcome that we try to achieve, even today, that you will be glorified in it. May everything that we do be an act of worship to you. We, we ask all this in your precious name that's above every name. Amen and amen. You guys have a great day, and we'll see you next time.